Good evening, everyone. My name is Priya, and on behalf of all the volunteers and the Santa Clara Valley chapter of CNPS, I welcome you all to tonight's program. Uh, so the title of our program tonight is The Beauty and Complexity of Evolution, Manzanitas as the example, uh, and our speaker tonight is Tom Parker. This is the team that's bringing you the program. I'm Priya. Uh, your greeters are Grace and Deb are back over there. Uh, Vivian is handling the tech support. And of course, uh, last but not the least, is our speaker, Tom. Before we get started, uh, we'd like to read the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the work done by the Santa Clara Valley chapter of CNPS lies in the homeland of the Amamutsun tribal band, the Tamian nation, the Ramaytush Ohlone, and the Mowetma Ohlone, who still live and thrive in this area today. We hope to learn from them uh, and support their work to restore traditional practices and heal from historical trauma. So uh, how many of you are attending a CNPS program for the very first time? Uh, if you can let uh, me know. Yeah, Vicky, sure. <laughs> OK, so a few of you. So welcome uh, to, this, uh, 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 to this talk. So CNPS is a nonprofit environmental organization. Uh, it's founded in 1965. It has more than 12,000 members in 36 chapters spread not only in California, but also Baja California. The Santa Clara Valley chapter of which we are a part of um, covers Santa Clara and Southern San Mateo counties. Mission of CNPS is to protect California's native plants and their natural habitats through science, education, stewardship, gardening, and uh, advocacy. If you're not already a member, uh, we encourage you to join and su uh, support our important work. Uh, when, you're, uh, when you're a member, not only are you helping support California's incredible biodiversity, but you're also creating a wonderful habitat for the critters in your uh, garden. Some of the benefits uh, include Artemisia and Flora journals. Uh, so these are two journals published uh, by uh, CNPS. You'll be getting them. Blazing Star is our chapter's newsletter. So it has everything about uh, events such as this one, how you can participate, volunteer, upcoming activities, field trips, um, everything that you would like to know. So, uh, and of course you'll get also uh, discounts at local nurseries. Uh, so you can join by going to that URL, uh, cnps.org or forward slash join, or you can scan the QR code on your screen. Some of the upcoming events. So in March, April is a very busy time for a chapter. We have lots going on. And this is uh, most of it, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah I um, try to include everything here. So uh, coming up is our photo group meeting, which is an ongoing uh, photo group uh, event that's held on Zoom um, on Fridays uh, once a month at 7 p.m. So if you have photos to share or if you just want to get some photography uh, tips, uh, please uh, join us. Vernal Pool Wildflower Walk, uh, Tours, these are uh, a series of tours um, organized uh, to look at vernal pools in, uh, in the Fremont area. Um, so the dates are mentioned there and uh, the times are all different. You can uh, see the details on our chapter website. Uh, I have to mention this is for, uh, this particular uh, tour is for CNPS members only. So if you're not a current member, please sign up uh, or you can uh, ask one of us back there to help you sign up and join our chapter. Newsletter mailing party is the next event that is uh, on Tuesday, April 23rd. This is at our office in Palo Alto, uh, our chapter office in Palo Alto. So this is where we are going to mail out our chapter newsletters, uh, which we do usually now only once a year since uh, COVID. Uh, 
it's mostly online. So uh, the upcoming newsletter is going to be a physical newsletter, which is going to be mailed out. So we need some help for that. And if you're interested in um, joining us for this work party, please talk to me after the event. Native plant ID, again, this is also in our office in Palo Alto. This is again on Tuesday, April 23rd at 7 p.m. Uh, this is where we help everyone identify um, native plants that they have. Uh, you can bring cuttings or you can work with photos. We have microscopes, hand lenses, and we have books that will uh, help guide you to identify whatever you whatever you need to ID. Wildflower Walk, this is in Rancho Canada del Oro in Morgan Hill, Sunday, April 28th, uh, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And the last one is our ongoing habitat restoration projects. Uh, these are at Lake Cunningham Park and Cataldi Park, both are in San Jose, both are parks in San Jose. Uh, we do habitat restoration there on Saturday mornings. Uh, and uh, the, we basically maintain the native gardens. We do planting, uh, weeding, mulching. So um, you can, you're welcome to join that as well. You can find more information about all of these events uh, by going to our website, cnps-scv.org. Um, or Meetup. Meetup has most of our events on it. So uh, you can see, scan the QR codes. The first one on the left is for our chapters website, and the second one is for our chapters meetup group. Coming up is our uh, big spring event. This is our wildflower show, so this deserves a slide of its own. Uh, this is uh, on Saturday, April 27th. Uh, this is organized by our chapter uh, along with West Valley College. Um, it's from 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. And um, the theme of this year is bringing uh, biodiversity home. Our keynote speaker is Bart O'Brien. He's going to be talking to us about creating habitat and beauty in your garden with native plants. So apart from his talk, yes, uh, Tony. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, so uh, apart from his talk, we are going to have workshops and tours. We are going to have uh, booths that you can shop from. Um, what else? Uh, oh, the most important thing. We're going to have hundreds of uh, wildflowers and plants on display that you can take a look at. You can photograph and you can read the labels and everything, get to know them. Um, we'll also have music. Uh, and it's a family friendly, friendly event, so bring the family along. Um, you can find out a little bit more about this by going to uh, the first link on the page, the nps-stv.org forward slash WFS for Wildflower Show. And of course, we need uh, your help in making the show a success. So uh, we need help for two days, the day prior to the show, which is uh, Friday, uh, April 26th, and the day of the show, which is April 27th. There are different shifts available. Uh, you can uh, volunteer for one or more, whatever uh, works for you. And information and how to sign up is on the second link on that page. Tony is one of our volunteer, uh, one one of the organizers of this show. So, uh, do you want to say something, Tony? Uh, just. Yeah, I just wanted to ask what you were saying that um, we are in need of volunteers for this work process. We need people to help us with the volunteers. So, um, uh, if you have questions that you'd like to volunteer, uh, either for Friday or Saturday, uh, come up and talk to me. Uh, I can give you lots of information about the different kinds of positions that are available, or if you need to. Oh, there's free food, yeah. There's free food for volunteers Friday and Saturday. So yeah, I forgot that part. Okay. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> okay. 
And I'm sure uh, with all this happening, you'd like to stay in touch with us. Uh, we have a new mailing list and announcements are sent mostly once a week. Uh, and you can uh, join the mailing list by sending an email to that Google group down below. Just some housekeeping before we begin, uh, please mute your phones. Uh, we're trying to record, so we'll try to keep the lights on during the presentation. Uh, we'll finish by around 8.30 p.m. or so. And uh, uh, there will be time after the program to ask questions. Finally, for, uh, for the program tonight, um, our speaker is uh, Tom Parker. Tom is a professor of biology emeritus uh, at San Francisco State University, where he taught for 40 years before uh, retiring from teaching. Uh, he was educated at the University of Texas and the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he completed his MA and PhD. He's principally an uh, evolutionary ecologist, ecologist who works mainly in tidal wetlands and chaparral. Uh, he's the principal author uh, of the treatment of Arctos Tafilis in, in the flora of North America and the Jefferson Manual. So please join me in welcoming Tom. Thank you. Oh. Is this your book in one hour? What's that? Is this your book in one hour? It is. <laughs> <laughs> Except I'm not going to tell you any cheating trade. Oh. oh. <laughs> um, we do give workshops if anybody wants to ever learn how to identify these, these creatures. Um, this year is at Chico State, so it's a bit of a drive. And that's the first weekend in May. And next year, the Jepson uh, at Berkeley will be for that at some point. My arm got broken by it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just use it. Yeah, that way it won't look crazy. You need me to use a microphone? I've, I've lectured for 43 years. <laughs> so, good. Um, if anybody in the back needs me to use a microphone, just wave your hand or something. Uh, I want to talk about Manzanitas today, and that's the genus Arctostaphylus. This is a group that I worked really hard not to work with if that makes sense. Um, I had a student uh, uh, in the early 1980s who wanted to work with uh, woody plants that had uh, obligate cedars, which are shrubs that are killed by fire, and those that re-sprout after fire. So two different life history responses and yet depend upon dormant seed banks uh, to regen uh, regenerate their population, both groups. And we wanted to test a lot of ideas about those different life histories. And being trained in Santa Barbara, I knew all the different Cianotha species. And oh, let's let's find some sprouting and non-sprouting Cianothas up here in the Bay Area. And there just aren't sprouting Cianothas in the Bay Area. You have to go to the Sierra, way north, or go way south. And it was like we're going to have to work with Arctostaphylus and. They're all over the place. And the only trouble was we didn't know how to identify them. When I took uh, plant tax, we were taught many different ones, including those that are, in retrospect, are completely easy to key. Um, but as soon as I would turn away and walk away, it was Arctostaphylus spa. I could never remember what the species was. It was like my brain didn't want to do it. Somehow I got drug into this and... Now I find it the most fascinating uh, group of plants that California has. It's the most diverse woody group in Western North America. Okay. It just happen to be shrubs, but they're, they're fantastic. 
since this is a CNPS group, I thought I would show you pictures of a lot of species, but I'm going to cram them all onto single slides. Because I love to do lots of slides. The, there's only 106 species and subspecies. So it's uh, a little bit to deal with. And when I got coerced into doing flora of North America, remember, I'm, a, I'm an ecologist. I'm not a systematist, although that was a minor. Um, and I thought, well, I know 30 or 40 of them. This, this won't be too hard. But as soon as you start traveling through California and looking at all the different species and trying to key them out, you, you hit high humility. And <laughs> it was a crazy time. But they're physically very diverse and quite gorgeous. Um, you have different kinds of colors when they uh, originally de develop. These, these two are very convenient for you if you drive to Prunedale. Um, Arctostaphylus pajaroensis has bright red leaves, or some of the individuals do, um, in early leaf growth. Uh, that's right next to a hooker eye that doesn't do that. Really easy to tell the difference. Um, but the flowers are all pretty much the same for all of the different species, but the, the color of the red bark uh, varies. Uh, the shape and pubescence of the leaves and stems varies a lot, and the fruit varies a lot. So think about all of those different characters, and you can actually key them out, right? Nobody's smiling, so clearly you haven't tried to do that. Uh, this the top photo on the left side is Imbricata, that's San Bruno Mountain. You get to if you crawl to the right spot, it covers an entire ridge, and it's prostrate. So. Yeah, and that's San Francisco in the background. I thought I would introduce you to a few of my favorites. I only have about 30 or 40 favorites, so only a couple. Um, this was my first favorite. Um, it has some outcrops in your mountains, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, on the other side of 17. Uh, but after that, you have to kind of jump way north and um, go all the way to Mount Tamalpais and that's where I fell in, in love with this plant. Um, it's heavily canescent, and canescence just means it's got gray hair. And it has beautiful flowers, and some of the ones on Mount Tamalpais are pink flowered. Uh, so the white and pink together is just stunning. But as you go further north, because that species goes all the way to Oregon, they're mostly white flowered and much larger after that. I also love all the auriculate leaf species. So those are the ones that have earlobes at the base of the uh, leaves, which is why it's called auriculate. And the uh, lobes often go around the stem. So this is the Alameda species, Alida, in new growth. That's not the way it looks at the when the when it matures. And this one is closer to you. So in the Santa Cruz Mountains, Andersonii is a rather lovely plant as well, with large inflorescences that have glandular hairs, which is a good way to identify it. So if you want to key manzanitas, you not only have to be in the field to see if they have a burl or not, but you also need a 15x hand lens, because a lot of times you need to look at the pattern of hair that's on uh, different parts of the plant. And sometimes when you work with weird groups, weird things happen, like removing all of the weeds on this part uh, of a traffic island that they were going to tear apart and discovering a plant that was supposed to be extinct in the wild. So this is Arctostaphylus franciscana back in uh, 2008. I was actually in Europe and got a call from Michael Jasse who said, uh, I need you to come and identify a plant. <laughs> okay. Right on the pathway to Golden Gate Bridge. Um, they had to move it because that area was going to get trashed and planted it in another area that I've been told I'm not permitted to tell you. And 
I actually had an NPR guy next to next to it, but I made sure I was okay to do that, and they said no. So I was like, well, you can't do a story about it, but here it is. <laughs> okay. Now, what I really want to talk about tonight is not the systematics or taxonomy of this group or their diversity per se, but reasons why they're so effective at being everywhere in California, because they're in every county except for Sacramento County, which is, I think, almost appropriate. And I want to talk about two specific mutualisms involved, and that's uh, a mutualism is just when there's an exchange of some type between two different organisms. And it doesn't have to be a perfect balance. It just has to be workable for each uh, individual. And you're familiar with a lot of them because there were a lot of photos during the pr earlier presentation by Priya of pollinators. And that's an obvious mutualism where the pollinators get nectar or pollen and the plant uh, gets fertilized. So that's a nice exchange between those two. And for manzanitas, they're actually pretty important for bum bumblebees and a lot of native bees because they bloom in winter, uh, right as those things emerge. And they're one of the few major uh, nectar sources. Uh, early flowering is something to keep in mind for later. A lot of different kinds of pollinators. So, that's one you're familiar with, but I want to talk about another mutualism that's actually very critical for the survival of these creatures. Because if you go look for manzanitas, what kinds of soils do you find them on? Do you find them on miserable, shallow, no nutrients, it dries up fast? So the worst kind of habitat uh, that California has to offer. And the reason we still have so many manzanitas is they couldn't be converted to agriculture or forestry. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of place. If you travel around California, you notice a few things as background for what I'm gonna talk about. And that is that manzanitas almost always occur with conifers, if conifers are available in that habitat. Have you ever thought about why that is? As an ecologist, you're, you're program to look for patterns and then say, is this a real pattern and what's causing it? This is a, a white leaf uh, manzanita that's in the um, coast ranges that co-occurs on serpentine areas with the uh, gray pine. And that's a little north in uh, northern Napa County. Here's one closer to you, Glutinosa or Schreiber's manzanita with knobcone pine. Uh, that's on the Lockheed uh, Reserve that you can't get on. It's a great place to go. It's got two species of manzanita only found on their property. And you have to make all these arrangements to get there because it's a secret you know, place for military stuff. And what's really cool is the first time we, we ever got onto the site, um, they sent a, a guy to watch us the whole time. And he said, don't take pictures of any of these things, which were broken down things where they used to do missiles or something. I don't know, but it looked really strange. But he also, I had, my first job was in New Jersey, and he just reminded me of organized crime guys. <laughs> and I expected him to pull a pistol out or something, but it was a very strange experience. Um, Rare, rare <laughs> you know where Big Basin is? Uh, yeah. you, um, there's a, a road, uh, I can't remember the name of the road, but you basically drive up the main road and it's near the end and they're very nondescript entrance. So. It's, the sandy. it's Monterey yeah. Shale, so it turns very clayey. Oh. And it's really hard to drive a car on during winter. So you, the good news is you don't need to see the flowers, you need to see the fruit, and that's summer. So good. Here's one of my favorites, Gabalonensis, the Gabalon manzanita with coulter pine. That's on granite outcrops that pop up um, on small patches in the Gabalon Mountain. Um, the reason why it's one of my favorites, it's a gorgeous plant, and I named it, so that always helps. 
and close to you, uh, the Bonnie Doon Manzanita with Ponder Pinus ponderosa on sand, right? That really holds a lot of nutrients. So. <laughs> and here we are back with um, this one happens to be uh, Oloniana, another one that was we named. Um, but this is on Monterey Shale back in the Lockheed area. And this Monterey Shale is miserable. Um, my greatest experience with it, though, was taking kids to see the elephant seals and the docent. It was, we had a bunch of little kids. The docent loved kids. And she took us all to a spot where there were a lot of crumbled pieces of Monterey shale. And she said, pick it up and stick it on your tongue. And it sucks all the water out and sticks to your tongue. So I have photos of all these kids with little white rocks hanging from their tongues. It's not like sticking your tongue on a frozen pole, but it's weird. Now, if you're on soils that dry that have no nutrients, how are you going to grow and create a closed canopy system? You end up needing a mutualist. In this case, it's a fungus, and the fungi are actually highly diverse. There's hundreds and hundreds of them that associate with manzanitas. And what they do is they form a sheath around the root of hyphae, and some of the hyphae penet penetrate into the roots of the plants. And it's called a mycorrhizae, which literally translates fungal root. And there are hyphae that leave that area and go into the soil, break down organic matter, take up any of nutrients and water that's available, and bring it back to the plant. And the plant gives it... Um, molecules that are close to sugar, but basically energetic molecules so that it can have energy itself. So it's an exchange of water and minerals, and it gets uh, carbon compounds uh, from the plant. A lot of different uh, organisms that are mushrooms that you see in the forests or chaparral if you crawl around uh, after the rains. And this is what the mycorrhizae look like. Uh, on this side is one on uh, Douglas fir. Um, that particular fungus also grows on manzanitas. On the other side, Lactarius uh, on a manzanita. And notice they have slightly different structures, though the same species will actually form different structures because the conifers will form this style and the members of uh, one subfamily of the Iricaceae, of which manzanitas are a part, form that other style called arbutoid. And they both have sheaths that wrap around the roots. And the only real difference is the way the hyphae penetrate into the roots. Um, and the conifers, they just stay in the cell walls and the spaces between cells. I know you love these details, but I do. And in the arbutoid, they also penetrate in the, the spaces between cells and the cell walls, but they also push into the cells and push against the plasma membrane, the cell membrane and increase the surface area contact with, with hyphae so the exchanges can happen uh, faster. Kind of cool. Lots of beautiful things. I got pretty good at IDing mushrooms for a while, and but, you know, you lose that through time. It's, it's work. So this is a mutualism that's shared by um, close relatives of Manzanitas. Arbutus, the madrone, is another example. Um, the other thing you need to know is that they also share a large proportion of the same fungal species with conifers and a smaller proportion with oaks. And that creates a different kind of ecological dynamic in a, in a place like California. So as a mutualism, the manzanitas are providing the fungi with carbon, so it has a source of energy, the fungi, and the fungi provide minerals and water, and that's, the, that's that key mutualism. But what is also pretty interesting is if you go to stands of different ages and you look at the percent cover of uh, ectomycorrhizal um, shrubs, so oaks, shrub oaks, but mostly manzanitas, um, and then how many trees are invading those um, habitats. The more uh, manzanitas you have in a stand, the more trees will begin to invade uh, that stand. And eventually, they'll take over uh, the manzanitas. There are places in Marin that hasn't burned since uh, World War II. 
um, where the Manzanita stands are basically gone in lots of places, and Douglas fir has taken over the site. And you can find all the dead bodies of manzanitas in the understory, slowly uh, beginning to rot away. But that creates this incredible dynamic. So you have a stand of manzanitas in places, but because they have that mutualist, it can be shared by conifers, that conifer seeds can get in there that facilitates the stand of manzanitas converting to forests. And that takes a while. It's not a span of time that humans uh, normally observe, right? Um, but you would notice the stands of manzanita slowly uh, shrinking through time if you started young and kept going out there. But the good news is we have wildfire. I think of that as good news, right? And that creates an uh, opportunity to return it back to manzanitas because manzanitas have dormant seed that sits in the soil for decades and decades and is stimulated by fire to germinate. So the fire takes out the conifers, stimulates the manzanitas, and they all uh, come right back up. So you get them back again. What's EM? EM stands for ectomycorrhizal, uh, which is just the physical structure. So. Okay, so that was one of the mutualisms I just wanted to mention to you because it has that nice dynamic and you can see it in the mountains around here. Uh, you can see it in Bonnie Dune um, and the areas where both of those fires have occurred in the last 15 years um, because the knob cone pines have really uh, increased in, in cover in the sandy areas. And if you hike back to the schist areas, uh, they're not doing quite as well, but there's still uh, a lot more conifers than there were before the fire. Uh, so they're they're doing quite well. But I want to talk about another um, mutualism that I've been investigating more uh, recently. And to do that, I need to go into some evolutionary con context for you. And so I want to ask the question, where did manzanitas actually come from? How old are they? And what are their close relatives look like? Because if you look at close relatives, you can often um, make hypotheses about what characters have evolved through time. So let's take a look. And it turns out that manzanitas are bloody old. 15 million point two or 15.2 million years ago is the oldest fossil and lots of younger fossils, but these are the oldest ones that have been found. So that puts it as, well, compare humans, we're a little over a million. So these, these creatures have been around for a very long time period. And they're a part of Western North America is where all the fossils have been found in what you think of now as Nevada. But uh, 15 million years ago, there wasn't much of California. The coast ranges were a series of volcanic islands uh, the Sierra Nevada didn't exist. There were pre-Sierra uh, areas. And Nevada wasn't the valleys and uh, the basin and range kind of mountains and valleys that you see now. It was what they called the Nevada Plano. So it was a high elevation plateau in much of western Nevada. And that's where all these fossils originate from. And there was a huge river that came off that went into California, and that's where a lot of the gold um, originated from and ended up in California. So that's a really interesting, but that's really a long time ago. So let's think a look, uh, take a look at its close relatives. And manzanitas are a part of a very small subfamily of the Iracaceae. And if you don't know that name, you know the family, because that's rhododendron, blueberries, cranberries, heathers, heaths, all of those things. But there's only six genera in the Arbutoidae. One, you surely know, the madrone. But there are 10 species of uh, Arbutus, the madrones. Um, a lot of them are in the Mediterranean region. Um, we have one. Um, Arizona has a distinct one. And Mexico and Texas have all the others. So. Um, they're distributed in a two widely different places. Coomerostaphylis or summer holly, there's 10 species and 10 subspecies. And that's mostly Mexican. We have one species in California. 
Kumar uh, staff with diversifolia. Or the Baja birdbush and the Mission Manzanita only have one species in each of those genera, and those are Southern California and Northern Baja. So do you guys go down there and botanize? Have you seen these creatures? Yeah, okay. You do know Arctostaphylus, though, the Manzanita, 106. There is a very weird genus, though, just so you know how old this lineage is. It's called Arctos, and it's called the Alpine bearberry, and they're only found in Arctic and Alpine locations, not in Mediterranean climates like all the rest of them and or seasonal. Do you like trees, family trees? Yeah, I probably shouldn't ask you if you like them or not. Yeah. This is just a family tree, and these are out groups, and they are just to help see, you know, make the sequence of branches be chronological, it's to the best of knowledge of people doing it at that point. And I put a box around the Iracaceae, the the rhododendron heather family. But I want to what I want to show you is that the manzanitas are part of the Arbutoidae, which is a very early diverging group. And it has no close relatives, and nobody looks like it. So it's really distinct uh, within the Iracaceae uh, as one of the subfamilies. So I thought I'd let you see what these guys look like. You know madrones. Um, you probably know strawberry tree, which is Mediterranean. That is a horticultural thing all throughout California. And there's a hybrid. Madrone that's all over at least Southern California. I don't I don't know how much is planted up here. They have these nice uh, fleshy fruit. Um, most of them have smooth red bark, but not all of them. It's even much older than Arctostaphylus. So the fossils in Western North America go back over 30 million years. Okay, uh, there's one fossil that's 52 million that's kind of controversial. We're not really sure if it's Arbutus or not, but we're just gonna stick with over 30. But that means it's twice as old as the oldest fossils that we can find of Arctostaphylus. So the other thing for you to think about is, well, if they started in North America, how did they get to the Mediterranean? 30 million years ago or so, the Atlantic Ocean was pretty narrow. Yeah, the ridge in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that is pushing North America and Europe apart, it wasn't that big. So it wouldn't, wouldn't have been too hard as long as it was before 28, 30 million years ago. Then it gets harder, but that it's not impossible. You just need a bird that's constipated. So here's the distribution of Arbutus. The one on the West Coast, that's just our Madrone. And Mexico has another nine or so. The numbers keep changing. And the Mediterranean has uh, three. One on the Canary Islands, that little blue dot by Africa, and two in the Mediterranean area. Summer holly is another gorgeous one, uh, at least in flower and fruit. It also has uh, fleshy fruit and bell-shaped flowers. Most of them, what's that? I have once. <laughs> there are two individuals in the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. In Southern California, I've only seen them in flower. What's that? Were they different? Sorry. Oh, my drones, they make uh, a jam in Europe from it. I don't know if, if anybody's done that here, but Native Americans ate it. Um, they're not that sweet, my drones. Um, this one, I'm not sure about. Um, and there's a reason, and I'll show you why in a second. The Baja birdbush, smooth whitish bark, um, and the fruit now are very different. They're dry when they're mature. They're not fleshy. It's also really odd for the entire family because it has two leaves per node. So two leaves come out of the same spot, um, sometimes three leaves, and the whole family is one leaf per node. 
So it's a very odd plant. Um, and you can see from its species name, the leaves are opposite each other, right? One of my favorites, and suddenly, is uh, the Mission Manzanita, Xylococcus, bicolor. Um, it also has dry fruit that mature to a black color. It also has these lovely pink flowers uh, with uh, yellow lips, you can tell. You've got lights on, so it's not as, not as gorgeous as it is on my computer, but you can probably still see that. These guys are basically Southern California and Baja. Ornithostaphylus, there's a couple of individuals at the border, and they lost most of the population to putting up the wall. Uh, and then Arctostaphylus, also dry fruit at maturity. A much different distribution pattern. Most of what you're seeing is one species, Arctostaphylus uva ursi, that Linnaeus name. <laughs> and that's a high elevation or, or beaches uh, species. This is where everybody else is. Western North America has one subspecies in Arizona that doesn't occur in California, and then two other species uh, that are in Mexico and Western North America. They don't make it to Canada. So um, almost everybody is in the California floristic uh, province. Here's that odd genus. I thought I'd let you see pictures of it. There are two that are good species so far, Arctus alpina, um, which has the same kind of flowers. And it has uh, black fruit as well. But these are succulent, fleshy fruit kind of like the madrones and the poly. Arctus rubra has red fruit. You can kind of see it's translucent and, and fleshy as well. So you gotta be up in different habitat from Mediterranean that you're used to. Um, it's got a very Northern distribution. It only comes into the United States in um, Vermont or maybe New Hampshire, one mountain peak. Otherwise, it's Canada and Eurasia. Yeah, this is its habitat. Little tiny plant with a lot of ericaceous shrubs from other subfamilies with it in mostly dry, rocky circumstances. If it's a wet alpine area, you're not going to find it. All right, let's just think about the genera that are in Mediterranean climates. The, the older lineages are trees, and trees are in forests, and they, they have relatively moist conditions. They have deeper soils. Um, they have surface fires. It's a common fire, not canopy fires, although they do get canopy fires. Um, madrones and oaks all re-sprout, by the way. Uh, and they have birds and rodents that are particular to forests. They prefer forests. But as the middle Miocene arrives, we're getting to warmer, drier conditions in, in Western North America. And you, you start having shrubland uh, begin dominating different areas. And now you're in relatively drier habitats. Um, the, soil, the, the soils are shallow. Um, and because they're short, you end up with only canopy fire. So everything's going to burn every time there's a fire. You can't run a fire beneath a shrub. Right. Your birds and rodents and other animals are now going to be distinct uh, from what you would find in a forest because uh, birds and rodents prefer different kinds of habitat. So you have very different ecosystems that you're moving all the shrubs into from where the madrones were. So let's see what happens to them. And we'll only talk about reproductive traits um, because it's easier. And I don't have to go into leaves and stems and xylem and phloem, all those wonderful things. So you already know the madrones have the fleshy fruit. They have five chambers if you open up one. And in each chamber, there are seven seeds if they've all matured. And they have very thin endocarps. So an endocarp is the innermost layer of the fruit uh, that surrounds the seed. 
Um, a radically different version would be if you uh, take a peach and the skin of the peach is the exocarp and the flesh is the mesocarp and that stony part that you can break open and see the seed in, that's the endocarp. So that's a really thick stony endocarp. These are really thin. You go to the, the summer holly, the cumarosaphilis, you still have the fleshy fruit, but now you only have five seed and the endocarps are stony and thick and they're all fused together into a solid structure. Um, so now think about what is going to cause a plant to be selected to develop a stony structure around its seed to protect the seed uh, that's so different uh, from a close relative. Okay. If we go to the dry fruit, um, the mission manzanita xylococcus also has um, the stony endocarps with five chambers and the seeds are fused together. They're really hard to scrape the mesocarp off of those. Archistaphylus glauca, the big berry manzanita, um, also has stony endocarps and the seed are all fused together. But now it's not a regular five, five, five. Now our Archistaphylus averages about seven or eight seeds uh, per fruit. And they can have up to 10, but I've never found one that much. But if you look at all of the species, you find out it's pretty variable in manzanitas. So in the panel labeled A, those are just five different species. So you can see the differences in the sizes and the shape. Some of them are globe-like or completely round spheres. Others are squashed like little apples, which is where you get the name manzanita. If you go to the middle panel, panel, that's with the outer part of the fruit taken off. So that is just the seed with the stony endocarps on them. And you can see some species, they're all fused together, but most of them, they're not. And on the last panel, it's to remind you or to point out to you that for most species, it's variable how many seeds get fused together, if any. Okay. So in that last case, in one condition, all the seed are fused, but on the other four conditions, only one or two um, get fused together. Others are free. Now, what I want you to think about is why you would have stony endocarps for all of those other genera and why you end up with variation in the manzanitas. And remember, manzanitas are the only one that have diversified. But there's one other character that I can't show you, but I'll just tell you what it is. And that's that manzanitas are the only genus in this subfamily that have dormant seeds. So they're physically and physiologically dormant and you can't get them to germinate unless you do a lot of work. And they are, that dormancy is broken by fire and that's how they do it in nature. So a lot of strange nutlets, and we just call these nutlets because they're like little nuts, and they're fused or not, and they're dormant, really different from everybody else in that subfamily. So here's another tree for you. I know you love that. Um, we're assuming our view is this ancestral, and that the ancestors to this group were probably uh, fleshy fruited species, and they definitely re-sprouted because everybody in the Iracaceae re-sprouts some way or another. If you start to separate the other shrubs from the madrones, you find out that now all of them have thickened endocarps or little nutlets. And in the, this first part, they're all fused together. But after Camarostaphilus, all of them have dry fruit. <laughs> and one other thing goes along with that dry fruit. Madrones and the summer hollies, they flower late in, in the spring. Like they haven't flowered yet. The uh, mission manzanitas, the Baja bird bush, and the manzanitas, they've all flowered long, long ago. They've, they flower early in winter. Their fruit matures in late spring, early summer. And what happens in summer? It dries out. And you 
hold a whole bunch of fleshy fruit through a dry season, it's costing you a lot of water. So they got selected to move their flowering period earlier and earlier and to convert their fruit to dry fruit so that it doesn't matter. They're not losing water um, on their fleshy fruit. But birds love fleshy fruit and don't really go for dry fruit, especially forest birds. So what's going to happen? And uh, just to remind you, Archistaphylus has the dormant seed, which means their seed stays in the soil. That's a, called a seed bank. And it just stays for decades and decades until there's a fire of some sort. Or actually a bulldozer seems to work too. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another piece that I'll get to later, and that's that they have obligate seeders. So um, individual that are killed by fire completely rely on that dormant seed. So you can see manzanitas are totally different in their ecology from all the other taxa, right? And this little white box with a succulent fruit on the far right and the other characters, that's just to remind you there's a lot of differences among these groups. Um, but what I wanted to do is to tell you there are a lot of natural selective forces that are influencing those. And these aren't all of them, but Birds are clearly involved in dispersing succulent fruit, but all of a sudden you're getting thickened into carps and fused into carps, and now rodents are going to be involved in this process. Uh, it's drying up. The middle Miocene was the last time you had pretty good summer rain, and then the summer rain has deteriorated ever since then. And now we have the driest summers of all the Mediterranean climate. Okay? And that means we have fire. So you get all these different processes influencing the evolution of this group. It's a fantastic group. It's just gorgeous. Okay. Don't you agree? Yeah, good. All right. Here's my lovely plant again, Gabalon answers. We've got to get this fruit. It's important because that's the next generation. This is an obligate cedar. And all of the, even the re ones that re-sprout require seed because that's how they um, re regenerate individuals that eventually die in the fire. But you got to disperse it. And there's two ways manzanitas get dispersed because you have this dry fruit. Has anyone ever eaten a manzanita berry? Yeah, they're good. They're very sweet. You just can't chew them, right? If you chew them, you go to the dentist. This is how they get long distance dispersal. And unfortunately, we've modified these creatures a lot. We don't have the big bears around here anymore, but they are creeping back. Uh, I'd love to see one in Santa Clara Valley and see how people respond to that. It, it, they're not as bad as the mountain lions, are they? At least, well, who you knows? Coyotes are good. What's nice about all these carnivorous creatures and omnivorous creatures is they don't chew the berries. They just suck them down and their stomach extracts a little bit of the vitamins and the sugars that are in the outer parts. And then it gets deposited as scat. And you can see some of those fruit are almost completely whole. Some of them have been messed up a little bit. And we have all this seed just sitting on the soil surface now. Is that a good place for seed and wildfire habitat? No, come on, you can do this. We need fire. I know you guys live in dangerous places here. Yeah, so do I, but I made sure I live close to the coast and I'm pretty safe. These guys have to get buried in order to survive a wildfire. So how are we gonna get them buried? If you go to a place after a wildfire, this is Bonnie Dune after the Martin Road fire, you find the little seedlings coming up. You notice they already have red bark. <laughs> fire releases the dormancy and, and permits that germination. But what I want you to do is look around at the fires and you start to see this kind of thing. That's a little cluster of about 20 or 30 uh, different manzanitas all coming up in one spot. So what's causing that? Ants. Good try. 
Right, but there's another story hiding in there too, because there's a lot of predispersal predation by insects. So that's far too many, uh, except for a multiple fruit. Right, you're getting getting two, three, or four viable seeds per fruit, and that's like ten fruit. How are we going to get that many fruit there? Rodents. I don't like rodents. I trap them. They invade my yard. They've stripped bark off one of my lemon trees. They eat my apples before I get to them. Little suckers. But when I started finding out that they do a lot of work with manzanitas, it's like, huh, well, what's happening here? Have yeah, have another one. <laughs> Rodents are nice. They grab fruit, they stuff their cheeks. They are suspicious of all other rodents and they bury them in little caches and they run away and they go find more fruit, stuff their cheeks and make another cache. And they have incredible noses. So if somebody else has done that, they will find somebody else's cache, dig it up, stuff their cheeks, run off and bury it someplace else. So they, there's a lot of thievery among the rodents and they move the stuff around and, but they really, according to mammalogists who told me, manzanita seed, yeah, they're okay, but they're kind of low priority. Um, so in a pure stand of manzanitas, they're not that low a priority, but if they can find anything else to eat first, they'll eat that other thing first. And they'll only go to the manzanitas later. So they're actually doing what? They are building the soil seed banks because they're burying the seed. So these are cool because they're not just taking them long distances and depositing them on the soil surface. They're digging holes and burying them so that if there is a fire, whew, the seed are going to mostly survive the fire. Okay. The good news for manzanitas, rodents have high turnover and a lot of things like to eat rodents. And some things... Some caches will survive. So they're creating the soil seed bank. And to me, that is cool. So all of a sudden, huh? if you go to a post-fire area and you see these little clusters, the seedlings come up, and guess what? If you have a high-intensity fire or a spot, almost all of the seedlings in the high-intensity area are from rodent caches. We don't know down here. Um, there might be a rodent cache that was shallower and some of the seed were killed, but um, clearly only rodent caches are surviving the highest intensity parts of, of fire. And that means the rodents are critical for the recovery of manzanitas. So if you like plants and you like manzanitas, you have to save rodents. Is that a weird thing to think about? So here's an idea. Here's the distribution of rodent caches. This is the soil surface. And that distribution is 52 different caches that we were able to find. And that's a kill zone during a fire. The upper two to four centimeters soil is a great insulator depending upon the texture of the soil. Um, but it isn't perfect in super high intensity fires. The, the nice thing is rodents plant them not only shallow, but they plant them pretty deep. And the average is about 4.2 centimeters, so uh, roughly two inches. And the medium is a little long, larger than that, but there are scattered ones that are deeper. And that's gonna be based on the fact that there are small rodents that are really tiny and bigger rodents that be, that'll dig deeper. So that kill zone will vary depending upon the fire intensity as well. So rodents. So, so is this cache four four centimeters below the ground? Yeah. And a fire runs through. We see four centimeters below the ground are going to germinate and push up forward. I mean, this... Yeah. The ones at ten centimeters, no. But four centimeters isn't that hard. And if it's flat, then it'll stay four centimeters. If it's a slope, there'll be some erosion in the first rain. 
How do you think that you know, bullying is just to you know the, the area where the people have to try my heart? How, how do they know? They, they don't know. They're, they're just doing normal rodent behavior. And that's the cool part. The rodents haven't been selected in any special way, but the plants have modified their fruit so that rodents now prefer it because they're granivores. They love seed and they eat seed and they're afraid of all their buddies. So they catch all over the place. Okay. So this is a monotone virus. And 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 Nope. I actually went through all my slides once and I have a slide of this from like the early 1980s and I didn't think anything of it. It was like, isn't this cool? I mean, maybe there was a hole and a little fruit fell in it or something. And it was only later, it was actually the Bonnie Dean Martin fire that I started seeing lots of them. It was like, There's, that's not holes, that's rodents. So they're doing this. But every species I've looked at, every fire I've gone to that has manzanitas, you find rodent caches. Okay. And you, of course, you have to do experiments to prove that they're rodent caches, right? Otherwise, it's just hearsay. So we did a simple experiment putting fruit in a petri dish on top of a pizza pan with fluorescent powder. So the rodents want that fruit, they have to cross the fluorescent powder get it on their feet. And the nice thing is they leave little fluorescent trails everywhere. And you just get those techs to do the crawling. So I, I had a colleague out there with me. He was the one taking the photo. He's older than me. We found two caches. The women found 50. Now, I did find four others, but they had already found those caches and moved them again. But there was fluorescent powder about three centimeters below the surface. So there used to be fruit there. And this is what it looks like when you're crawling around. So it's really fun to do this, right? It's always good to take younger people with you. Um, the caches were Bonnie Dune fire. This is Fort Ord, where we did the experiment. Oh. So all of these bloody rodents, they're not so bad. They do a lot of work, and they're critical, it turns out, for the survival and dynamics of manzanita. So that's kind of my story. This plant-rodent interaction is a mutualism. Right? There's an exchange. The plants produce tons of fruit. The rodents eat the seed. Um, but they also bury the seed down into the soil below where at least some of the seed will survive fire. And now the manzanitas can regenerate their stands. Okay. So you end up with these persistent seed banks thanks to the rodents that are doing all the work burying them. The manzanitas have persistent or now have dormant seed, so they persist in the soil for a long time period. And remember, we've got re-sprouting manzanitas. They also require um, dormant seed. And manzanitas evolved this new character that only in California in shrubs and flowering plants is only in Arctostaphylus and Ceanothus. And that's obligate cedars. And those are where the adults are killed by fire and they completely depend on seed in the soil to uh, regenerate their population. And Ceanothus, the rodents just eat the seed. Uh, they're small seed and they, they work their way down differently. Uh, there's very few rodent caches of Ceanothus I've ever seen, so two. Um, but for manzanitas, it's critical because their fruit are large 
and they're not going to go through uh, soil. Where did that seed dormancy come from? Well, it's part of the mutualism that the rodents started. They started caching stuff. They didn't have, their ancestors didn't have seed dormancy. Their seed would just germinate. All their close relatives, the seed germinate. They, they, they don't persist in the soil. So their caching permitted the evolution of seed dormancy. You just need a little bit of variation, a couple of mutations, and it gets selected for, right? Because the seed will sit there, a fire will go through, and guess what? They're, they're not shade tolerant. And after a fire, there's lots of sun. The organic matter has been turned into minerals, so they are happy, right? And they can establish themselves and get it going again. So seed dormancy uh, permitted the evolution of obligate seeding. So you can, and that's kind of critical because they represent the majority of manzanitas. They're over two thirds of the uh, species okay, in this group. And what's cool about obligate cedars is that after each fire, all the adults are gone and all the teenagers come up with no adult supervision. And natural selection can now push the population uh, to follow climatic changes, right? Just think about California. Nobody here was around 12,000 years ago, but we had a glacial period that retreated. Um, it warmed up. And then around 8,000 years ago, it got really warm and hot for about four or 5,000 years ago. And then it switched back to what it used to be 10 and 20 years ago, our normal time. So those are big fluctuations. And if you look at tree rings and conifers, you know, every 100 years, we go through climatic uh, fluctuations as well. Obligate cedars can follow those fluctuations with each fire cycle. So rodents are actually very important because they represent the first step for you to get the sequence of events, right? Survival of fire, dormant seed, all of a sudden you can have obligate cedars. It's really, it's disgusting to think that rodents are this important, but they are. So let's think about what happens with manzanitas. They ended up in places with shrubs and summer drought getting worse and worse. Their phenology shifted so that they flower in winter. So their fruit is dry and mature uh, before the dry summer. And now rodents are their main seed predators, not birds. And rodents cache, put them in the soil. And in the context of fire, seed buried in the soil can be selected for seed dormancy. And once you have dormant seed, you can get selected for um, obligate seeding. You guys recognize that there is an obligate seeder that you're also familiar with, and that's knobcone pine. It's killed by fire, and it keeps its seed in cones. It doesn't rely on rodents, except when the cones open and the seed falls on the ground. Guess who gets them? Rodents grab them. <laughs> they eat some of them, but they also freak out about their neighbors, and they bury those seed, and the, the pines are able to germinate. It's just a slightly different twist on the same kind of story. Rodents are important for them, too. So manzanitas have evolved to accommodate all the changes in their environments over at least 15 million years. Uh, the increasing summer drought, uh, miserable poor soils, they already have those nice mycorrhizae to, to help them out. Okay. But there is another environmental constraint they ended up with when they ended up in troublings, and that's wildfire. And they're adapted to wildfire. They're adapted to particular regimes. You can't burn them over and over again because they need to build up a seed bank, right? You, you need 15 to 20 years minimum for a little response, and 40 or 50 years before you get a, a good response from the seed bank, okay? So go protect all those manzanita stands from cow fire. It wants to grind them up. And remember, some 
survive fire, but because of those persistent seed banks, we ended up with obligate cedar. So seed dormancy and persistent seed banks started with these bloody rodents bearing seed in their caches, moving them around, hiding them from each other, but it, they were doing this in the context of fire. Rodents do this everywhere, but it's because these places burn all the time that you ended up with these different kinds of evolutionary pathways. So these mutualisms I, I'm talking about tonight are not the sole reasons for the diversity of this incredibly awesome group. Okay? These are beautiful plants, um, but they are a very critical part of some aspects of their survival and their evolution. And I hope I've illustrated those. And these are friends of Manzanitas you may not have noticed or thought of as, as friends. You know, notice I put the daytime ones. All the other rodents, you have to crawl around at night. And I don't do that. I, I use trail cameras with infrared lenses and lights. <laughs> and, right. So a beautiful group of plants, thanks to rodents. No, not really. I'm just gonna remind you of all these uh, pretty creatures here at the end and say thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure and any questions? Whoa. Um, um, they they do a little bit, but um, no. The, the bottom line is no. So the man that property. Um, do they love fire. It gets them tough, right? Uh, they require chemicals from smoke to break dormancy. Is that close so enough? Like um, there's a tiny hole at the top where they used to connect to the mother um, ovary and the they do often require a heat wave um, to cause the cells in that little hole to break open and then chemicals and water can get in and do the rest of the job but they also require a chilling so they need a heat pulse uh, a chilling with chemicals from smoke and then warming soil and then they germinate <laughs> it's a mess Yes. So, so what led to the extreme diversity of the Manzanitas and, and their sort of very low localization of, of different species? Um, well, if we contrast it with uh, uh, Ceanothus, is that okay? Sure. Um, Ceanothus doesn't have any mechanism for long distance dispersal um, because it has dry fruit that burst and explode and just throw the seed out on the ground. So their only long distance dispersal is mud and deer or any animal that steps in the mud and gets a seed stuck in the mud. That's a slow, uh, miserable process. But Ceanothus are older than Manzanitas and more widespread, so they haven't had too bad a problem. Arctostaphylus has been able to adjust to different soil types. They freely hybridize within two, there's two lineages inside Arctostaphylus and they don't hybridize very well across, which is why you can find places with multiple uh, species at the same place, um, because they're reproductive barriers. And also they have two ploidy levels. They have um, regular diploids, like we're all diploids, one set of chromosomes from the mother, one set from the father. Um, but some of the manzanitas are tetraploid, so they have two sets from each parent. and. That means they don't reproduce well with diploids. So there's another way they can have barriers. And they basically exchange genes and come up with the right combination faster than anybody else. And they can they parse soils, they parse slopes, 
or different climate. You get to something that's more uniform like the Sierra Nevada and there's not that much diversity, right? Only as you go down in elevation. Sorry, I'm also deaf. Where, where the roads were. Yeah, what? I think it would be fun. They need kind of soft soil. Their arms are kind of short. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. why is the trunk so cold? Well, if you if you Google it, you will find madrones are sometimes called refrigerated food. Right. But in, in fact, I have a paper coming out in Madrone later this year. And I went out with a uh, an infrared uh, pistol to do temperature. It's no different from any other species. The only difference is it's smooth. And you put your skin against it, you have super high surface area contact, and you are moving your feet rapidly into the plant. And you go, wow, it's cold. But in fact, it's the same temperature as something rougher. It's just that you're not, you don't transfer heat as fast. So it's physics, it's not a cool thing. Like the dry one is really close, it's just going dark. <laughs> okay. I've seen, so, um, some more trees uh, in the spring term was the same there, but I've seen birds lay down on Manzanita and on, on hot days. They transfer heat, they feel cool. Uh -huh. Yeah. What, what a dog do if you've got a slick yeah. flat floor that's made out of concrete or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, you do transfer heat. It's just that it's not actually cooler. I know, I hated to do that. <laughs> but I'd love to do that. Well, the way I understood it was, I, I want, I was going to that thing, and I looked at the top. The bottom floor is right on the outermost part of the top. Yeah. Now, most of the shrubs will have some thicker woody material between you and the south floor. In the manzanita, it's like less than a millimeter that you're in contact with fluid going up and down the trunk. But it doesn't matter in terms of the temperature. The trunk uh, equilibrates with the air temperature. And in the sun, it depends on what the color of the bark is. So madrones are kind of orange, and they don't heat up as much as darker red manzanita in the same condition. So I, I tested that too, and I painted a piece of wood that I sanded smooth with different colors, mm -hmm. put it out in the sun and check the temperature, and it does just what physics says it would do. <laughs> so the more dark you have in the color, the hotter it gets. Move the same colors into the shade, they equilibrate with the air temperature. What's that? Why is the bark so smooth? Oh, <laughs> that's a speculated <laughs> question. Um, some people think it's uh, a way of getting rid of uh, epiparasites or uh, epiphyllals, so things that have attack. Uh, attached to the plant, like lichens, um, um, parasitic bugs, and then everything flakes off and everything goes to the ground. Um, the only trick is with um, manzanita is they have striping where mm -hmm. um, the, the bark dies back. And but the cool thing is ants live there. Ants will invade those stripes, form little colonies. That will keep going. Yes. So I just want to thank you. Um, 
that in the context of And I'm reading a book called um, Trans is White. <clears throat> I'm a bird and the author's name is Merlin Hawkins. Um, I want to say Sheldon, but it's, a, it's kind of a burden to me. But yeah, my mind is all fucked. <laughs> I just don't see things. I just see fungus now. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. Thank you. Well, now when you go out, you'll see a little rodent patch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dug out. I'm going to be looking at some little pieces of little bark. <laughs> Now, ironically, sometimes it's not a castle that's dug up, it's an underground mushroom that's dug up. Ah, yeah. Especially up in the Sierra. Yeah. No other questions? Come on. Yeah. So you mentioned in mean, private piece that you have the going man who's been saying there are the arms yeah. in the garden. And you said you have 46 papers. Did you mention some of your papers? For the garden. Oh, for the garden? Yeah. Um, Refugio Ansis does really well for some reason. I don't know why. And it does really well everywhere. Like a friend of, has a bunch of them in his yard in Escondida and San Diego County, England. I'm on the coast. It took a while to establish because I'm a Gale Clay. Um, but once it established 10 years later, it's doing happy. and. Um, the prettiest one in my yard is uh, Island Manzanita, Santa Cruz Island Manzanita, in Soil. Um, <clears throat> Horticulture of Uber Earthies has taken over parts of my slope. Uh, Francis Gaina has taken over parts of my front yard. Um, Densiflora has finally died after 25 years. Mm -hmm. The others are okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So this is just a comment, but the uh, Santa Cruz Arboretum has a conservation garden outside. I'm pretty sure they have one of the lot pieces in there. That's very nice net and you collect them outside. So that's all. I got a few stuff in the wall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the um silicola that grows in that sand. Can you grow that in garden soil or how do you get the water? Okay. Um, I'm not a horse culturist. Uh, I have a miserable yard. It's, mm -hmm. it's stale, the first down the side, uh, and it's very thin. So the thin soil is good, except I do have the water in the summer. Um, I think for silvicola, I would dig a an area up and put a lot incorporate a lot of sand in it for so better drain. I don't know how well it's going to do. So, so Vickel is right at that fog level. It's mm -hmm. kind of above the fog in some days and not other days. So I don't know how well it would do in my area on the coast. Mm -hmm. the ground, but if you're a little further inland, it might, it might be fine. If it doesn't get too hot. But it needs, I'm sure it needs drainage. Yeah. I planted one in December. We had all that rain, and I think that's why it died. Yeah. It looks like it might be a parent for um, blue mosses, one of the parents, and blue mosses are on monitor scale, so it might have some flexibility for soil. We just Need a bad year. Okay. <laughs> I have it in my car. Uh, yes. I got and I had it for two, almost two years now, except it's not really young at all. It's not a half. It's not a half. But it's still a green leaf. The bickle is like a junior ranger of connection. <laughs> How do you know how to get it? It seems like you can send it in part to the other piece and so for that, but you can get a message in the market. I guess that's what it's saying. It's almost almost better than it's almost not like that. Yeah, um, there, there was a study by uh, three Mexican scientists who were examining the Mexican ones in here. Um, 
And that was the river that you spoke, with the chemicals uh, in water and kill uh, it. And then they got poor germination. So they got germination. And I, I can get germination by getting a lot of chemicals and then putting a lot of salmon on it. Um, you can connect with them. <laughs> Sometimes you'll get some, but they're, they have low feed viability as part of the problem. And they get invaded by insects, by the fruit of the thing. Yeah. If you open up a lot of fruit, you'll find the larvae. <laughs> yeah. What was the question on your back? I'm regarding that same topic. Um, have people had better luck using these gaps? No. I, I didn't try that one. Go to hell. Can you talk about um, how the health can be made to feel better from breathing? Or is that your health for them? Um, I don't think they do well with breathing. Um, and I would like a heart of gold. Um, there's a there's a guy Phil Van Solen who lives in Sonoma County. He's thirty to forty nine millimeters in his yard, and he was super successful at reading. Him, so he he's kind of like a millimeter whisperer. Or something. I don't know how it works, but um, I don't prune them and they just come. They just look different. But um, in that. Oh. Do you know, um, is it less in those zones? Do, do, do animals eat the leaves? What? Do animals eat the leaves on um, the main community? Um, are they browsed? Uh, they're not browsed by large animals. They're consumed by uh, leaf miners. And lots of larvae of uh, caterpillars and moths, um, especially the new growth. Um, there's a, a one fungus, Exodicidia, that will take over a branch and then turn bright red, leave it down there. Um, insects take over um, the fruit a lot. There was one for. PhD student studied the Greenland Sand Engineer, the Sierra species, which is widely distributed in the West. And he found like 300 insects associated with Manzanita. About 180 of them were herbivores. Um, 140 were predators of those herbivores. <laughs> a whole world in there. Uh, wood rats will. Take a branch, strip the leaves off, and then eat the bark. So sometimes you'll be on a manzanita stand and see a pile of green leaves. You got to wiggle that leaf off. <laughs> but they, if they're eating the flowers, they're pretty good. Well. Um, Which one? The back first, first. I wonder if there's some back for manzanita. Um, so. Oh, well, anything with a similar mycorrhizae. So, other. I'm in first. Shrub oak. Conifer. <laughs> if you want to have them in your yard. But not every, you know, the pine family has the echomopos. Redwood, cypress, and stuff. Um, a lot of members of the. Um, uh, Prima, what's that thing? Mean? There's a, there's a, there's a family with a lot of fruit trees. Um, they sort of go both ways. Uh, they'll have endomycorrhizae and ectomycorrhizae, and if you have a next to manzanita, they'll, they'll create a network. Um, what else? I don't know. I have ramnus next to mine, but not, it's not called ramnus anymore. Yeah. Frangula. Yeah, frangula. 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 It looks good. Uh, I put Cianosis around because I love Cianosis too. Whatever you feel like. 
I can learn from the founder of their exposed to the people I asked me to come and talk to them and I can talk about online. Um, it looks like it, yeah. but Dave also said to limit the carbon that it can do photosynthesis for. Um, it also seems to get a lot of uh, that strike and die back. So I'm not really sure. I don't really, I don't really want to turn in and I tell people that I just don't want to really try to turn. Um, yeah, I try to avoid it. Yeah, I, I'm not sure at all. Yeah. I think it's been one of the highlights of it, but I can't be to do that with some of the time. Yeah, and some people have shared them, they get it a little too much, I think. And actually, it's maybe if you're trying to get it back to natural form. One of my clients say you hear the garden here today. And so I'll, I suggest you maybe turning it a little bit so it looks a little more normal. But they're going to keep it like a ball. <laughs> 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 I didn't plant that um, smooth bark question. By <laughs> no. Um, if you like Manzanitas, there is a field guide. I'm a co author on it. You can get it. I brought a copy if you want to see what it looks like to see if it's worth your while. It's cheap. I get a quarter of books. So. <laughs> really, that's like one. I mean, I already gave you. You got a first edition point and a second edition point. <laughs> you got all the errors out of the second edition. All right. Okay. I want to thank Tom for his wonderful talk. <laughs> Can 
I just want to put in a plug for our wildflower show. It's going to be great next Saturday, the 27th. Oh, there's what about the holiday show? What? What are you doing? There's busy enough me this year. And I also a reminder that there is that Vernal School Field Trip. That's the first one is this weekend on Saturday. So you can go have an opportunity. It's only for members. And you have to contact the organizer. Just a reminder, there's one on Saturday. It's not in the Blazing Star, and it's only on our field page on the website. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you got the uh... yeah. So I'm just going to stop the stop recording. Okay. So I just took pictures of it. Um, it looks like an Ocula, and those are my pictures. Oh, great, because I, I mean, I learned, so I thought maybe that could be good.